then you get into some other things like, well, I'm going to run an isolation transformer for everything. I love isolation transformers when they're done properly. When I understand that of the three types of noise, it's going to do a fabulous job at one of them, common mode, symmetrical noise. Asymmetrical noise, not so good. Ground noise, it's not going to do a damn thing. And it's also going to have another problem. That isolation transformer could be the size of the rooms we're sitting in, and it would still current compress an amplifier because it is an inductive device. Where current transit's concerned, you're moving the opposite direction that you want to be. So in a Niagara, even though a 7000 has two intensely expensive isolation transformers, they are for the constant current source components only. A power amplifier never goes through them. Again, it's understanding what the application is and what's the best tool, what's the best technology I can throw at it. Every one of these competitors, I can show you the negatives, but I can also show you the positives. You know, one of the reasons we bring them all in is I reverse engineer every single one of them. I love my so-called competitors. I learn from them, I get inspired by them. I'm not necessarily gonna copy them, but sometimes just, again, it's, it's the why they did it. And looking at somebody's work and going, that was a really good idea right there. Okay, ultimately I would do the entire product differently, but you know, like, um, uh, th th that was really clever. Oh, you know, they were probably listening to this. They were probably looking at this effect and that probably led to this. All those things are something that if you have dedicated your life to this practice of this type of engineering, um, that's your food. No, and it's okay. something that I learned when talking to you was, um, didn't realize that, but you said it before, power was invented over 100 years ago, and nowhere at that time people were thinking of high-end hi-fi system and 4K TVs and game consoles that can do 120 frames a second. It was meant to power a light bulb, right? To power a light bulb, what we have in our house, uh, our house is perfect, but not for what we're doing. So when you said everybody's trying to fix it, then great, we just have our solution. And like you said, it's using the right tool at the right place. I think throughout the, the audio quest lineup and every new product, product you've built it's it's the right recipe the right ingredients but execute execution is important as well right i you may be a better chef or a better musician than i am i can play the same notes but it's how you do it that that's important and that that, that really would open my mind when we we looked at these products um what, what what would be cool to to talk about is what led you to build the 7000 your way you built it right why why do we have four high current and then two isolation transformers and those little details well there's again there's so many little details it almost kind of like helps to to break each one of them down because <laughs> each one of them you can spend some time with Right. Uh, but, but again, it's sort of like, okay, well, again, look at your application. What are you trying to do? Well, one of the things I have to find is what's in the system. I know in my two channel system, I'm going to have at least a stereo amplifier. I might have some monoblocks. I might have some subwoofer amplifiers. Right. I might, I might be biamping. So I have to look at, okay, depending on the expense of the Niagara and therefore the likely, you know, like um, uh, accumulative expense of the system, it's likely to be paired with. Mm -hmm. How am I going to deal with this? How many high current outlets am I going to need? And by high current, what's usually meant by that in the power game is, you know, these are the ones that are made for a power amplifier, or sometimes they'll say whatever is your, you know, like a, your high current devices. But really, a more sophisticated way of looking at that is just power amplifiers, because, you know, the RMS draw on a small AVR or integrated, on average, might only be two amps. I can show you projectors, I can show you flat screens that are drawing more than that on average. But that flat screen and that projector, once they draw that three amps or that five amps, it'll never move once it's in conduction. Again, that power amplifier will be many times its fundamental uh, for audio transients. And you don't have to be listening to ear splitting levels. Everything's doing that because as great as loudspeakers are, they're relatively inefficient. So mm -hmm. you're, you're always at the edge of your power, assuming you don't have, you know, like a, a recording that's kind of compressed and slam limited. But anything that sounds natural, you've got a lot of dynamic range to contend with. So for high current, um, one of the things that we have is something in our 3000, 5000, and 7000 Niagara transit power correction. And this is a 
technology that is borrowed from power factor correction. That goes back to the 1920s. It's still in every major uh, building or every major factory that you've ever seen. What we're doing is a variation on that technology, but it's for the transient only because the power supply in these amplifiers doesn't have a problem typically with sustained energy or just basic sign tones. If we all promised to only listen to pipe organ music, we're good to go. But if we have anything that goes for a second, like the plectrum you know, of, of a string instrument, like the strike of a drum or the sforzando attack, you know, like of a piano, well, that all of a sudden is a peak to peak, you know, like a, a voltage swing that's enormous and very quick. And that's where the best power amplifier power supplies in the world get into trouble, not because they didn't care, not because they didn't put a lot of work into them, but because all the emphasis is a direct current, like a battery, the DC part of the equation. We're bolstering the AC part of the equation that's feeding it. It's balance. You have to get both. Right. And we give it, you know, like anywhere from 55 amps peak up to 90 amps peak of current reservoir up to 25 milliseconds, more than enough to get through the transient peak, be a buffer, electrical buffer stage, and you know, like um, essentially make that power supply in the amplifier as efficient as it can be. Then the source outlets, do you treat it the same way you treat your high current? No, you don't. Because again, they're not the same devices. This is a current where the device comes on and then after a second or so, it stabilizes. I have to treat it differently. But let's say I have a system where I'm playing vinyl. What's likely today if I'm playing vinyl? Well, there are certain things we can assume, but one of them is there's a real good chance if it's a premium system, I've got a low output moving coil cartridge. What does that mean? That means that my phono preamplifier is 65 to 70 decibels of, of you know, like of my signal gain in order to get to line level to my amplifier, then that's gonna bring it up another 20. So let's say that that vinyl recording has 70 to 80 dB of dynamic range possible. That they did absolutely everything right as best they know how to do it. If you start taking these numbers and you work backwards, what you realize is, is that that, not just the cartridge, that entire audio system that you're playing your vinyl through with your low output moving cartridge that you love so dearly and paid so much money for, that system needs to be absolutely squeaky clean at a microvolt to not distort or nerf with noise all those harmonics and low level details. Would anyone care to guess how many systems in this world, regardless of price, multi-millions of dollars invested, are squeaky clean at a microvolt? Not one. And it'll never happen in my lifetime. I can guarantee you that's nearly impossible. So power being one part, one part only of that equation is one more area where everything we can throw at that system to unveil that information that's sitting in those grooves, we got to do. Uh, the problem is not quite so hard for, um, for digital, but it's, it's still a similar situation. The lower the level, the more we've got to do to take, take care of noise. You know, so many people make the mistake of assuming that noise means in the background or like white noise in the background or breaker one, two, or your local FM station breaking through a system. If your system is decent, no, those aren't the real problems. The problem with these types of noises is they're insidious. This is a noise you don't even know is there until you hear the effect of stripping it away, unveiling, getting rid of the mask, move from this to this. That's what we're really dealing with there. And then in terms of just, you know, so, you know, that's, that's the big difference in terms of like how you treat honor and treat a source component versus a high current, you know, component. And depending on the Niagara and the kind of system it's gonna go with, you'll have, as you move up the line, more high current outlets and more source outlets because on the bigger system, I have more demands that way. I have a smaller, more modest system. 
I don't need as many outlets. Um, I would love to throw the technology that's inside a 7,000 into a 1,200. I can't do that. It would be nearly 100 pounds. It would be out of many people's price range. And it's even more space than some people will have for a modest system. Again, right tool into the right system, the right place. But the, the common thread through all these things is honor what the system is going to be and make sure that all of the things that you're affecting, the, the unmasking, the unveiling, is as even and linear and consistent as it possibly can be, given the restrictions of size and cost.